What's up everybody, I'm Stella Chung and this is The Weekly Fix, the show where we round up all the gaming and entertainment headlines you may have missed this week. Retro games coming to the new PlayStation Plus seem to have been given modern day features. Plus, The Witcher 3 will come to current gen consoles this year. In the entertainment world, we explain the differences between the Gotham Knights game and show, and The Last of Us series may have gotten its release date leaked. Happy long weekend and let's jump right into it. PlayStation 1 games are coming to PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 via the new PlayStation Plus tiers with additional features like CRT filter, gameplay rewind, and more. Spotted by recent errors broken swiftly, PlayStation games have begun appearing on the revamped Malaysian PlayStation Store to prepare for the May 24th launch in Asia. Some PlayStation games that are listed as PlayStation 1 emulations are Oddworld, Aids Odyssey, Worms World Party, and Worms Armageddon, priced at about $5 to $10. As per the game description, each PlayStation 1 emulation will be enhanced with up rendering, rewind, quick save, and custom video filters with the ability to choose between default, retro classic, and modern visual settings. Players will also be able to change the aspect ratio of most of the PlayStation 1 games. Last week, Ben Studio revealed trophies are coming to some of the PlayStation 1 games on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5, with Siphon Filter being the first confirmed. Moving on, the vampire-themed online survival game The Rising has had so much success since its launch May 17th, it surprised everybody, including its own devs. Sunlock Studios was not expecting V Rising to get quite this big since its Steam Early Access release last week, hitting 50,000 players within a few hours. In over 24 hours, the game peaked at more than 150,000 players, and for context, more people are playing V Rising today than the Steam versions of GTA V or Elden Ring. That's huge! V Rising has now sold over 500,000 copies and is slowly building a strong community, even being in early access. Sunlock plans to expand and improve the game by observing and adapting players' feedback as it moves toward a full official launch. Sunlock's community manager Jeremy Fielding says the studio is committed to V Rising for the long haul, stating there's a lot of really cool little things in the game that I think it just needs more of, and we're planning to do that. I think that when we do get to a full release, people will really realize what our intention is in this being a fully fleshed out experience. And then after that, there's so many things we can still do. Personally, I just finally overcame the iron ore struggle, and if you're like me trying to figure out Blood Boss's abilities and what to do in V Rising, we have a couple guides to help you in your journey. And if there's something we have yet to cover, just let us know in the comments. I'm kind of obsessed with this game. And finally, developer Pocket Pair Games shows off some new gameplay footage for the upcoming Pokemon-like survival game, Pal World. As odd as it is to see a Pokemon-like creature getting a face full of bullets, the new Pal World gameplay highlights offer just a bit more of what we've seen before. From a Pal Gel Cell to headshotting a deer-like Pokemon in the head, Pocket Pair Games toots Pal World as a game that is quote, happy, easy-going lifestyle while farming and building with cute Pal. Yeah. For the human, maybe, not so much the PAL. Anywho, PAL World is still in development with no update on its PC release date, but Pocket Pair Games does say its release window is sometime in 2022 on Steam, though we wouldn't be surprised if it came in 2023. CD Projekt Red gleefully made the announcement today The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt next gen version is set to release this fall. In a Twitter post celebrating the 7th anniversary of The Witcher 3, the official game account shared news that the next-gen versions of the game are set to be released for fall of 2022. This is great news considering CDPR updated fans last month that the upgraded versions were delayed indefinitely. Anyone playing The Witcher 3 on PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X, or a beefier PC will see a visual and technical boost to the RPG when it releases sometime between October and December. PC, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One owners who already have a copy will get a free update that quote-unquote enhances the game. It probably won't be quite as impressive as the PlayStation 5 and the Series X versions, but it's nice CDPR hasn't forgotten about last gen. Sadly, Nintendo Switch isn't included, but really it's amazing the game can run on there at all. Considering Redfall and Starfield are delayed till 2023, this fall's lineup is looking a little slim right now, and replaying an even prettier version of The Witcher 3 is a nice consolation prize. 
Moving on, Sony has released its first official PlayStation bundle. And while it's a slow news day, otherwise we wouldn't even be talking about it because there's really not much to write home about. Spotted on various UK retailers, the bundle includes a game voucher for Horizon Forbidden West, costing about 500 UK pounds, which is somewhere around 550 US dollars. Although it's nice to see Sony finally able to release a PlayStation 5 bundle amidst chip shortages, it would have been cool to see something to make this more Horizon themed. Seeing an Aloy skin PlayStation 5 would have made more sense as an official Horizon Forbidden West bundle, you know, with foliage, maybe Aloy in an action pose, fighting enemies, anything. Anything at all, guys. Sony threatened legal action against a company that sold PlayStation 5 side plates last year and then took their own sweet ass time releasing official ones. They could have slapped some of those on there even. I mean, I would have been fine with a galactic skin. Anyways, we can't stay too mad because today Sony Santa Monica revealed that God of War Ragnarok is set to include 60 accessibility features when it arrives on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5, hopefully this year. Revealed in a PlayStation blog post, the studio has combined options that were available in the original God of War and the PC versions, as well as adding brand new features like full controller customization in addition to allowing players to choose from several preset layouts. Sony Santa Monica says they have invested heavily in providing navigational assistance, an improved subtitle system, and a lot of features including one that reduces motion sickness. The footage looks well polished and fully fledged out. We can feel pretty confident that God of War Ragnarok is still on schedule for a 2022 release date. It's time to lock and load as we finally have a release date for the upcoming Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. The official Call of Duty Twitter account announced today Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 is coming as promised this year on October 28th. Developed by Infinity Ward, Modern Warfare 2 will be the sequel to the 2019 Modern Warfare reboot and not a remake of the 2009 original. But Infinity Ward made both, so yeah, it's a little confusing. A video teased a few characters and potentially the cover art for the upcoming game, an operator with a skull mask. Ooh, spooky. Early details say that Modern Warfare 2 will center on the US Special Forces fighting the Colombian drug cartel. This could also be the last annual Call of Duty game as it was previously reported that the Call of Duty after Modern Warfare 2 will be released in 2024. This would suggest that the series may no longer be an annual franchise following Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard. However, reports also suggest that Activision Blizzard is committed to keeping the next three Call of Duty games multi-platform. Moving on, Final Fantasy XIV, the hugely popular MMORPG with over 1,400 hours of co-op content, is setting itself up to allow fans to experience the game as a story-driven single-player game. While Final Fantasy XIV will forever remain a rewarding and worthwhile MMORPG experience, its recent updates are slating the game to be playable as a single-player story-driven game. Players looking to take on the journey alone can now take NPC characters into dungeons, soloing content that previously required three other players to complete using the new duty support system, now renamed the Trust System. Final Fantasy XIV director Naoki Yoshida has spoken at length about how important the ability to solo Final Fantasy XIV is, and now the support system is finally in place to allow just that. The system will let players complete dungeons along with NPCs for expansions like Shadowbringers, Endwalker, and A Realm Reborn after the recent 6.1 patch. Final Fantasy XIV community commentator and streamer Michael Mr. Happy Poveromo points to the revamped duty support system as a gateway for solo players to experience the story of Final Fantasy XIV, but also argues keeping certain content multiplayer only encourages players to do dungeons with actual people. Raids and trials will still require a team of actual players to complete. Regardless, the shift in Final Fantasy XIV supporting more solo story-driven gameplay is definitely resonating with fans as creators hail Yoshida and the team's effort for the trust system to come to other expansions. And finally, the developer behind the Lord of the Rings Gollum have finally announced a release date for the game. The upcoming story-focused stealth adventure will have players control Gollum exploring Middle-earth before the Fellowship of the Ring. Players will hunt for that darn Bilbo Baggins who took the one ring you lost. Staying out of the way of the Dark Lord Sauron, players will come across familiar faces 
while deciding between which of the character's dual personalities gets the upper hand, either Gollum or Smeagol. It's up to you to decide. The Lord of the Rings Gollum is set to be released September 1st for PC, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox One, and Xbox Series X and S. Hideo Kojima is gonna have a field day today as his next game project has been seemingly leaked by Death Stranding's lead actor, Norman Reedus. Speaking to media outlet Leo Edit about Death Stranding, the actor said, We just started working on the second one. It took me maybe two or three years to finish all the mocap sessions and everything. It takes a lot of work. And then the game came out and it just won all these awards and it was a huge thing. So we just started part two of that. I am pretty sure the sequel announcement was meant to be a surprise as back in 2019, Kojima mentioned that if he made a sequel, he'd start from zero, indicating a major pivot from the original. In 2020, Kojima teased that he was thinking about a sequel, telling us here at IGN that it didn't represent major plans, but just fragments of new ideas. Looks like that was all a bluff. Considering Reedus' first impression of Death Stranding when approached by Kojima was, it's not Miss Pac-Man, it's so realistic, it's so futuristic, it's so complicated and beautiful, and I was completely blown away. I'm guessing he isn't very knowledgeable about how video game IPs work, so I won't fault him for giving away the sequel. How can you stay mad at a lovable Daryl? Everything he does is with good intentions, so can't get mad at him. Moving on, do you have what it takes to walk the path of the Jedi? Well, put your skills to the test as Obi-Wan Kenobi is coming to Fortnite. Hello there. You know it's a slow news day when we're talking about what's coming out of Fortnite. The Obi-Wan Kenobi outfit is set to drop on the Fortnite shop, including an Obi-Wan back bling, pickaxe, glider, loading screen, and emote. You can enter a chance at winning the outfit before debut by competing in the Obi-Wan Kenobi Cup, a Battle Royale Duos tournament Sunday, May 22nd. And finally, TikTok is making plans for more gaming, testing out a new feature that allows users to play more games natively in the app. TikTok testing is currently being conducted in Vietnam with plans to expand to other Southeast Asian regions later this year. The company's goal is to enrich the platform with new integrations and features to increase users' time on the app, driving more revenue. They pretty much want to keep you watching them vertical videos longer than you already do. As for gaming currently available on the app, TikTok has some Zynga games, but the hope is to go bigger and more ambitious. What TikTok should really do is partner with Ubisoft and bring Just Dance to the app to get people moving and grooving and making fun content. That idea is free, but if you want more bite Dance, you gotta call me. A Marvel MMO from the co-publisher of DC Universe Online has been nixed just six months after it was revealed. Parent company Enad Global 7 explained the cancellation in a blog post citing, quote, Re-evaluation of the development risk profile, size of investment, and the long-term product portfolio strategy for the group. Blah, 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 TLDR, too expensive to be worth the risk. Anyway, the Marvel MMO was revealed back in November of last year as being led by City of Heroes designer Jack Emmert at Daybreak Studios. And according to previous reports, this is actually the second Marvel MMO Daybreak had in the works to be preemptively canceled. Oof. That's not a good look. Even though no details were ever announced for the Marvel MMO, sources say about $50 million was invested over the course of three years. The investment will now be allocated for smaller projects, including continued support of its other games like The Lord of the Rings Online and DC Universe Online. Moving on, TCL, the consumer electronics company, held a presentation in Poland with a slide detailing mid-generation upgraded consoles will be coming in 2023 and 2024. TCL presented details of the PlayStation 5 Pro and a new Xbox would be coming in 2023 and 2024 as Gen 9.5 with devices providing gameplay in 60 to 120 frames per second at 2160p offering 8K ability. This should be taken with a grain of salt. It's likely speculation on TCL's part. Current games are just now taking advantage of 4K and 4K TVs, and global supply chain issues have prevented the PlayStation 5 and Series X from selling quite as many units as they might otherwise. In terms of exclusively next-gen titles, this generation is off to a slow start. Starfield and Redfall got pushed to next year, and Gotham Knights only recently dropped its cross-gen versions. 
will undoubtedly get proper next-gen games eventually, but between backwards compatibility and the massive install base, it doesn't seem like game developers are in a huge rush to leave PlayStation 4 and Xbox One owners behind. So maybe we shouldn't be worrying about upgrading to 8K consoles quite yet. TCL's presentation mentioned AMD Radeon RX 7700 XT, which won't be released until potentially September this year, so they're clearly thinking ahead too, but chip shortages could affect their projected timeline. It seems very likely that Sony and Microsoft will drop half-gen models at some point, but a 2023-2024 seems optimistically premature. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments. It's time to take a quick break. When we come back, learn the differences between the Gotham Knights show and the game. Plus, we have an interesting update on a Seth Green NFT series. See you in a bit. Welcome back. The director for the HBO Max series based on The Last of Us has stated the show may debut in early 2023. But first, after we got our first look at the Gotham Knights CW series, let's now break down its differences and similarities to the game. Take it away, Akeem. We got our first look at the CW's Gotham Knights series, and it looks just as bad as anticipated. Now, that may be a bit too harsh of me to say kicking off this story, but, you know, I'll let y'all be the judge. Now, in the image posted to the official Gotham Knights CW Twitter handle, you can see the main cast of Gotham Dittensons who were all accused of killing Bruce Wayne and must now all fight for their freedom and also protect the city of Gotham. Now, while the Gotham Knights in the CW series have, in fact, all appeared in DC Comics proper, they're not as popular or mainstream as their counterparts seen in the upcoming video game. Now, the video game features Dick Grayson, Barbara Gordon, Tim Drake, and Jason Todd, all heavy hitters in the DC universe, while the CW show has, uh, you know, Turner Hayes, Duella, Harper Rowe, and Cullen Rowe. Very recognizable characters, yes. Now, the most known Gotham Knight in the bunch is likely Carrie Kelly, who comic book fans know as the female Robin in Frank Miller's classic novel, The Dark Knight Returns. Now, the story of WB Games Gotham Knights will feature elements lifted from the Court of Owl storyline. In the synopsis for the CW show, a larger nefarious force is described as working within the shadows of Gotham, but it's yet to reveal what that secret organization might be. Now, if they're playing within the realm of the Gotham Knights comic book run, it's anyone's guess, but if they really wanted to somehow draw in fans of the comics, it'd be nice to see the Court of Owls make an appearance on the show. But honestly, if I'm being quite honest, a lot of fans would want this show to just not make an appearance at all. Judging from the poster, this very poster right behind me, the one on top here, it looks like Riverdale in Gotham City. Now, after the mediocre run of Batwoman on the CW with the very same writers that are bringing us this Gotham Knights series, honestly, you'd think the CW wouldn't want to waste its money on making shows that look, at least on paper, doomed to fail. Now, the main thing the Gotham Knights TV series is lacking is name recognition. I mean, where are my Tim Drakes? Where are my Damian Waynes? I get it, Warner Brothers doesn't want to waste its AAA characters on the small screen, but with the video game coming out bearing the very same name, y'all, this show just seems like it's more than likely going to miss the mark on its targeted audience. Now, think about it, y'all, okay? Think, use this brain. If you're excited for the video game and the lineup of top-notch Gotham heroes, wouldn't you be just as excited to see them in a live-action television series? Like, I really don't understand why they chose the characters that they did for this show, but I doubt I'll enjoy it. Tell you right now, though, I'll watch it just because it's my job to critique these types of shows, even if they're bad. But I'm curious to know, do you think this show will hold a candle to the upcoming video game? Which do you think is the more superior product? I laughed a little bit because y'all already know which one is, but I still want y'all to comment down below. In other news, the man who brought us WandaVision is bringing us a Godzilla live action television series. Now, according to Variety, director Max Shackman will direct a couple of episodes of Godzilla and the Titans coming to Apple TV+. Now, the live action series will apparently take place between the 2014 Godzilla movie and the King of Monsters sequel, focusing on Monarch. Now, we'll give you more details as they become available. And finally, did y'all see this creepy Sonic pop up in the new Chippendale movie? That hedgehog, I gotta say, is having one hell of a year so far. What with the release of the Sonic the Hedgehog movie sequel, an upcoming Netflix series, and now Ugly Sonic making a comeback in a Disney movie. 
Now, I initially wondered how this was possible, but then I realized Sonic is no stranger to lending his likeness to other companies indicative by his appearance in things like Super Smash Brothers. But this, for sure, by far, is the creepiest of appearances, making fun of Sonic's original movie design, which we all can admit, this is one hot mess. Now we got an update on the upcoming HBO series, The Last of Us, of course based on the Naughty Dog video game of the same name. The director of the pilot episode, Kantamir Balagov, recently spoke in an interview with a Russian media site. And according to comicbook.com, he revealed that while it's still currently in production, he indicated the show is set to arrive early next year. Now, The Last of Us began filming in Canada July of 2021 and is set to wrap this June. Now, this, of course, gives them the ability to go through fall, winter, summer seasons as they change to properly represent the changing weather from the video game, which takes place over the course of many months and years. Now, while we may not have a solid release date just yet, it's good news to know that the series is still on pace for an early 2023 release. Now you've probably seen the many set leaks hit Twitter, which we obviously can't show here, but there's this official photo that was released back in September. Now as more news breaks on the Last of Us series for HBO, we'll keep y'all in the loop. Now, never did I ever think I'd be making a video for IGN on NFTs, but thanks to Seth Green's compromised crypto wallet, I'm talking about open sea, bored apes, and crypto scams. Yeah, now this one's kind of crazy, y'all. Seth's been working on an animated project called White Horse Tavern, which was going to star one of his Bored Ape Yacht Club NFTs, but he revealed during a Web3 conference that just days before his animated character named Simeon Fred was set to make his world debut, he was digitally kidnapped. According to this tweet, Seth apparently got four high value NFTs stolen, one of which the Mutant Apes NFT got traded for around $42,000, and another one purchased by a user named Darkwing84 sold for about 200K. Since Seth Green technically no longer owns the rights to these NFTs, he can't move forward with the show he's been working on to exploit the characters. You know, this is causing me serious psychological harm. But of course, it's only a matter of time before he gets back what is rightfully his, even threatening to take things through the legal system. Now, the crypto space is wild. Y'all already know that. Now, I doubt we here at IGN will be giving you an update on this crazy ass story, but I'm sure CoffeeZilla, the internet's crypto detective, will be keeping a close eye on this NFT tyranny. Now, moving along to another story that'll probably divide the audience, Amber Heard. Yeah, just saying that name, I can see folks aggressively hacking away at their keyboards right now. Now, Amber Heard was apparently almost removed from the upcoming Aquaman 2 movie before the director and Jason Momoa stepped in. Now, according to the rap entertainment consultant, Katherine Arnold testified during the ongoing Johnny Depp libel case that Amber Heard almost got the boot from the upcoming DC movie due to all the negative publicity surrounding the case. I mean, come on now, did anyone expect positive publicity to come from any of this? Anyway, you know, to quote Arnold's testimony, quote, in February 2021, there were conversations that Amber's, I'm going to be technical with you, her option for employment was not going to be exercised, so they may not have hired her again. Her management team fought very hard and they ultimately ended up hiring her, but not only because of what her management did, but also because star Jason Momoa and director James Wan committed to her. Yeah, DC fans, Johnny Depp fans, please just let me know how y'all feel about this news. Use the comment section down below as, as, a, as a lightning rod for your frustration or however you feel about this. Cause I know how I feel, but I'm not gonna say it. Yeah. And finally, in some wild ass Samuel Jackson is taking on the role of Garfield's dad in the upcoming movie starring Chris Pratt in the lead role. It's a weird ass sentence that I guess it makes sense. Now, I didn't even know Garfield had parents to begin with. Every episode I've ever seen of Garfield and Friends never featured a single fucking parental. And yet, for this blockbuster movie, they've enlisted fucking jewels from Pulp Fiction. I mean, I, I know there's there's more modern references I, I could have made, but but that man. Samuel L. Jackson ain't no purple lightsaber eye patch wearing space pirate Chad. He's a big brain Brad. Wait, no, no, he killed Brad in that. He said, look at the big brains on Brad and killed him. Anyways, you know, apparently this big character is a new one in the Garfield universe, which is, is a weird thing to say as if like Garfield has a 
multiverse full of Mondays and lasagna? I don't know, man. Anyways, good for him. Good for you, Mr. Jackson, and your new role as this man's dad. Phase Clan took its first CSGO major title at PGL Antwerp Major this weekend after a 2-0 victory against Natas Vincere. They're also the first international team to win a Valve-sponsored event in CSGO. The winning lineup for Phase included Kerrigan, Twists, Rops, Rain, and Brocky. Phase originally led 12-5, but Navi was not going to let Phase take this win easily, and they tied the game off on Inferno. Kerrigan saved Phase from losing on that map as he got three kills in a 2v4 situation that pushed the game to overtime and Phase took the first map of the Grand Finals, 1916. Phase had already dethroned Navi as the top CSGO team in the world earlier this year after IEM Katowice and ESL Pro League Season 15. So this win at PGL Antwerp Major solidly places Phase as one of the best teams in CSGO esports as they take $500,000 home. I'm Stella Chung, and that was your Weekly Fix. We'll be back here next Saturday with more of the biggest gaming and entertainment news of the week. See you then.